Many years ago, a young man got out of Bible college, and uh, he was on fire. He had he'd studied the Bible. He had studied how to be a pastor. He knew exactly what to do. He took this small church out in the country, and he went out there, and, and he, he had spent several years of his life preparing for this day, and he knew exactly what to do. He went out there determined that he was going to win somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he, he was going to be a successful pastor, a successful preacher, and so the first thing he did is he got in his car and he went and started driving around in the community. And he found this old country boy out yonder that had been to the church. He understood a couple of times, but he wasn't regular. He didn't really come there. And uh, he, he was convinced that this man right here might be the first person that he could win to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was going to win somebody to the Lord today, and he was going to start with this old country boy. And as he went up to him, he was out there uh, doing in the fields working, you know, and he took and pulled him aside, and they began to talk. And, and uh, he said to him, he said, you know, listen, I'm the new pastor down at the church. want to invite you down there. But he, he was there for more than purpose of inviting him to church. He was there to share his witness and to lead this man to know the Lord if he wasn't saved. And if he was saved, to rejoice with him that he was a Christian. And uh, he said uh, he, he, he had learned all these great phrases in college. He knew exactly how to say it to the right people, you know. And so he started off by saying, are you laboring in the vineyard for the Lord? And this was his way of finding out if the guy was excited about the Lord, and the Lord was working through him, and was he out there laboring for the Lord and uh, doing all this kind of stuff? And the old country boy looked at him and he says, no, no, this is not wine, not grapes we grow down here. We grow corn down here. And uh, that, the corn's doing good. The corn's doing good, good. And he realized he'd asked the wrong question. This man just didn't understand what he was talking about, about laboring for the Lord uh, out in the, the fields of uh, winning people to Jesus. And so he, he looked at him and he, he thought, well, I have to say this in a different way. And he says, well, are you a Christian? The old country boy thought for a second. He said, no, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I'm, I'm a Jones. Uh, Christians live down the, down the way there. They're, they live down there. You're looking for the Christians. You need to go down there. That's where they live. They have a farm right down the road here. He, he, he realized that he, this guy just wasn't understanding what he was trying to get across to him. But he refused to quit. He was going to get through this boy yet. And so he thought, well, I'll just get it down as clean cut as I can. He says, are you lost? The old farmer looked at him and said, No, sir, no, sir. I've lived here all my life. I know exactly where I am. He said, I'm not lost. And uh, he said, I, I know exactly. I, right down the street and over here, I know, I know all of this area out in here. Oh, I tell you, the preacher, he was beginning to be a little bit frustrated, but he wasn't going to give up. And so he asked the most important question of all times. And it's an question for you, too. And he said, Are you ready for the resurrection? My way, he could tell the old country boy, his ears perked up and his eyes lit up, and he said, well, when, when's that going to be? And the preacher said, well, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, or it could be the next day. The country boy thought a few seconds, and he said, listen, I want you to do me a favor. He said, my, my wife gets caught off guard sometimes, and he said, please don't tell her that. She'll want to go to all three night, all three days. She'll want to go to all three days there. And, you know, I want to understand with you tonight that it's important when I preach that I preach in a way that you understand. And I wrestle with that. Uh, we were out to lunch the other day and somebody was talking something about something and, and stumbled on the subject they shouldn't do and that's to ask the preacher how he feels. And after a sermon, unless a lot of people come down front and feel the altars praying and and less people in the service say, listen, I want you to pray for, for my cousin that I've been witnessing to. And I think they're almost there. I, I believe they're going to come with me to church this Sunday. Pray with them. Their name is Bill and Mary. And, and, and pray with me. And unless I, I see these kind of evidences, I, I just wonder if, if I'm up here all by myself. And Sunday I just kind of felt that way. Like I was all by myself and nobody heard anything. And, and that the Spirit of God was only alive up here and He wasn't alive out there. Now, I know that's not true, but sometimes the uh, old preacher, he can get confused, you know, and he begins to think it. He's, he's, he's like the prophets of old. He's in this for his own self, you know, and that nobody else out there cares about Jesus and that nothing's happening and nobody's inviting their family to come to church and nobody's getting saved and nobody's bringing somebody to Jesus and, that, and leading them down the aisle to, to give their life to, 
to, to the Lord and to follow Him and professing that publicly in baptism. And, uh, you know, we, we need to encourage one another in the Lord. We need to encourage one another so that we're all busy uh, in the vineyard of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing people in and teaching the, the Word of God. So I thought, what will I preach on Wednesday night? And uh, the Lord led me to 1 Corinthians 2. Now, I like 1 Corinthians. I like the Corinthians and in, in, in all together. The Corinthians are a neat book because the Corinthians letters, especially starting over in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul had been up in Athens and he had been up there uh, preaching to these highfalutin guys. They, uh, they had this high in intellect language, you know, and they were great minds, uh, as many atheists are, they could debate any subject. And we live in a world today, I don't know if you know it or not, but, but occasionally I turn over to one of those, uh, those, uh, news channels to get aggravated. And, and they, they satisfy me and my wife real good in that. We don't, we don't linger on them very long. Um, but I'll tune over there and, and pull along. We're turning off the channel. We turned over this afternoon as we was coming in. We turned over to, to one of them. I think it was uh, CNN or Fox or one of those or at CNBC or something. And uh, I said, man, that's all they talk about. They only talk about one subject. That's, that's it. They just beat up on each other. That's all they do. And uh, why isn't there any news that anybody reports anymore? And so... We turned over and we listened to, what was it, Jack Benny? We found a classical station out there on the Sirius uh, XM band. We listened to Jack Benny show and we listened to uh, uh, Palatin. He was a, a cowboy and uh, uh, we listened to Palatin. We listened to some good radio coming in. I mean, it actually made sense and it wasn't the same old stuff. And, and uh, we begin to wonder sometimes as Christians, are we in this alone? Is the whole world gone crazy is there not anybody out there in the world that loves the Lord anymore? So I wanted to think with you tonight out of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, about uh, what Paul experienced when he went from Athens and he came down to 1 Corinthians and there he came to a church and he thought, this will be great. And it was a new church. It had only been open maybe several months. And, and uh, he expected them to be all enthusiastic and bringing people in to know the Lord and all this. And he got there and he found out that they just didn't know anything about the Lord and uh, that they were all tied up in the world. That's all they want to talk about. So the world stuff, which does nobody any good. And so he took and he um, he began to preach to them. And he, he decided he was not going to uh, preach in the high lofty terms, but he was going to preach in terms from the Bible. Just use the Bible and talk to people in common sense. And so this is the message that he brought to them as he preached that he was not there to inflate he was a, an intellectual, but he was not there to impress them with his credentials or his intellectual uh, speaking. But he was there instead just to talk to them about the simple Word of God. But more than just the Gospel, more than just getting people saved, he wanted to teach them the depths of the Bible that they could grow in the Lord. I'm so thankful that when I went to the first grade, my parents decided that I should go to the second grade after that. And when I finished the second grade, and I know they were proud that I finally got out of that, that they sent me to the third grade. They just kept sending me back because they wanted me to know more about reading, writing, and arithmetic and getting along with people. So that's what I want to look with you tonight at, is what is the difference in the church? What is the difference between the saved people and the unsaved people? What is the difference between... I know you sometimes just want to put your finger up to your head and say, I can't take it, I can't take it anymore about what's going on in the world. But you know what? We have to get out there and share with the people in the world and share with Jesus about what's going on. And there is a difference in the thinking of saved people and unsaved people. We ought to be talking about the Bible with each other. We ought to be talking about what God's doing in our lives with each other and encouraging one another in doing good work. So I want to look at three differences tonight, three differences between the saved people and the unsaved people. Now, we understand there's an obvious difference because saved people are going to go to heaven, unsaved people are going to go to hell. But I want to go beyond the simplicity of it, the gospel, and I want to look at what is the difference between them because that's what Paul encountered when he went to Corinth. And as we do, let's invite the Spirit of God to speak tonight. Because uh, if, if it's just me here and the Spirit of God does not speak individually to me and to you tonight, 
then you and I will go away from here tonight with no more knowledge than just a, than just a speech. And that's not our goal here tonight. It's to invite the Lord to come and through the Word of God and the preaching of His Word, for Him to come and teach you and me individually what's going on in our lives and how we can come closer to God and grow in His Word. Heavenly Father, I do invite Your Spirit to come tonight. We realize there's one God revealed in three persons, revealed in Jesus. We understand who Jesus is. He's revealed in God the Father in heaven who, who brought this world about and and, and maintains it, Lord, and keeps it going. And we see the proof of that in, in all the creation that is out here and how it's maintained itself for thousands of years. And, Lord, we realize that's not accidental. That's someone doing it. And then, Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit here tonight, the third part of the Godhead. Lord, that's the part that we invite tonight to come and to take the Word of God as it's preached and to teach us individually the things that you want us to know tonight and this week that will benefit us and grow us in the walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing I see that's different is the thing that interests us. The thing that interests us. What, what is it that interests us? As Christians, it's a hope. It's a hope that, like that I uh, said, you know, the resurrection, the, the, the coming of the Lord, the ending of the world, and, and God returning. It could happen today or tomorrow or the next day. And uh, we have that hope that Jesus, not only raised from the dead, but Jesus is still in control of what's going on. And He's going to bring all this to a conclusion. And those that believe in Him have a hope of going to heaven and uh, enjoy an eternity together. No punishment, no remembering the bad, but instead just bless with God's people and all the family of God. You know, that's exciting. But what's, what's there for the non-Christians? They only have the hope of today. Their only hope is that they live a little bit longer, that, that, that cancer doesn't kill them, that, that they manage to survive, not an automobile accident happened to them, that, that they get better from this illness that they're in, and that they can get out and do things again. That's their only hope. That's what interests the world. What interests the People in the kingdom of God, those that are in the Word of God and belong to Jesus Christ, what interests us is the hope that we have that the day, today could be the very night that the Lord Jesus Christ comes and we spend eternity in heaven. As we look at this passage, follow along with me in your Bible or, and also watch on the screen if you like, so that you can follow along in God's Word as we're in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And thank you, Matt, for pre-reading those scriptures for us. But now let's look at them one by one, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God, in other words, what God's done in my life and what God's done in your life, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I didn't come bringing you things of the world. I didn't come explaining science to you. I didn't come. He knew all of those things. He didn't come bringing brilliance of speech or wisdom. He didn't come with crafty spoken uh, speeches. For I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the focus of my thing. That Jesus Christ was crucified. He was dead. He was buried. Three days later, He rose from the dead and He's alive today. Amen? And I came to you in weakness. I didn't come to you in craftiness of speech and and using my uh, intellectual skills. I came to you in weakness. I came in fear of what God is doing and in much trembling that, that I not interfere with what God's doing, but add to it and expose it. And my speech and my proclamation were, my preaching, if you please, proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit. When I preach and when Paul preached, what he was saying is when we preach, it is our goal that people sitting in the pew will hear the words of God and all of a sudden they'll think, you know, this applies to this specific thing that's going on in my life. How did the preacher know that was happening? (laughs) The truth of the matter is a preacher doesn't. If we pray the Holy Spirit's here, the Spirit of God will take the words of God and will take the foolishness of preaching and will apply it in our own life so that what we hear is applied to our needs, the things that we need to grow with. You know, when, when I went to, 
uh, high school and started studying the, the, the finer uh, things of math, I, I remember going into the algebra class, and I had absolutely no interest in algebra. I didn't have an interest in the world. And when they started teaching algebra and X and Y and all that, I thought, man, why can't we just say 5 and 6? Why do we have to have numbers, letters for them? And all of these kind of different things, as I thought about all that, it bored me to death, and I didn't pay attention. And consequently, in my 12th year of high school, in my 12th grade there, I failed algebra. <laughs> you know what that means? I didn't graduate. I had to go to summer school. And, and I remember that remarkably because God allowed it to impress upon me because when we all lined up for our graduation practice and all that, I was in that. I was in that. And in that line, when we were all practicing, my, my, my teacher came to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Dad, come here just a second. And I said, Jess, what is it? And I was so excited about graduation and everything. She says, Stat, you failed algebra. You can go back to the room and sit while they're practicing. What? You know what? The Bible is talking right here about the fact that there are a lot of Christians that are just failing on the Word of God. They're not into the Word of God, so God's Holy Spirit's not able to take the Word of God and help them with their problems. You may be there yourself. And that's what I needed to do. Fortunately, I went to summer school for algebra only, and I got a teacher that took and uh, hit my head upside with a bat and uh, got my attention. She was the craziest algebra teacher there ever was. I was told she was crazy. She literally hung from the pipes. It was, a, it was an old school. There were pipes that run up there, steam pipes. And it was in the summer, so there was no hot steam in them. She literally hung from the pipe and talking about a dangling participle one day. And she caught my attention. And I started paying attention to her. She spoke to me. I mean, I was crazy enough to be like that. And she was too. And she started teaching me algebra and I learned it. And, and it made all the difference in my life and in my future education because I finally got out of high school just six months, uh, three months later than everybody else. And you know what? We need to get into the Word of God. We need to realize that God is speaking to us in the Word of God. But unless we're in the Word of God and allowing Him to change us, we won't get that. What interests us is different, if we're in the Word of God, than what people are interested in in the world. Your friends and neighbors, they might be so interested in what's going on in politics. They may be so interested in what's going on in science. They may be so interested in, in saving the, the frogs or whatever it is. But I want you to know something. If you're in the Word of God, your interests are not going to be in those things. Your interests are going to be in saving people's lives for eternity and making sure that you're growing in the Lord yourself. What interests us ought to be different than what's interesting the people in the world. And they're going to think you're kooky. There's a difference between the thinking of atheists or carnal Christians. And carnal Christian means people that are saved, but they act like they're, they're lost. There's a difference between the saved and the unsaved. Look back at that passage with me. As we look back in there, you'll find it says, I came to you in weakness, fear, and much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit in my life. That's who I wanted to please. So that your faith might not be based upon men's wisdom, but on God's power. Are your friends and neighbors talking to you about things of the world? Or are you talking to them about things of the Lord? However we do speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age. When we're talking with the intellectual, we talk to them about intellectually, but we don't talk to them about the intellectually about the things of this world. We talk to them intellectually about the things of the Lord. Not a wisdom of this age, but or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Have you ever noticed that those that are in charge won't be in charge tomorrow? And that those that want to be in charge tomorrow don't always get in charge? Those things come and go constantly in society. And we live under those kind of things, but this is what is for eternity. On the contrary, we speak of God's hidden wisdom in a mystery. A wisdom God's predestined before the ages of our glory. Sometimes my friends that 
that don't understand the word predestined because they don't bother to look what the Scripture talks about. They just have their own preconceived ideas what predestined means because somebody told them and they believe it. The word predestined in the Bible is always used for the same purpose, and that is that before God created this world, He pre-planned what was going to happen through the ages. We sit here today and we say, man, it's 2017. It's been a long time since the Lord started this place. When is he going to bring it to a conclusion? Does the Lord know? Yeah, he knows. He pre-planned it. He predestined. He predestined when Jesus would come and die on the cross. He predestined when you would be born. He predestined all of these different things. Now, he didn't predestine that you'd fall down the stairs. That's your foolishness. He did predestine to teach you in school, don't fall downstairs because you get hurt. And if you disobey those basic laws of gravity, then sure enough, you're going to fall downstairs. You heard about the old lady, and she fell down the stairs, and she lay in there at the bottom, and she says, man, I'm sure glad that's over with. She, she believed everything that happened in her life as a result of God making it happen. God don't make those kind of things happen. Stupidity makes those things happen sometimes. If you're having a busy day, then don't go walking around without a walker or a cane or, or holding on to the wall. God predestined that you would have brains to use to help yourself in a case like that. But he goes on to say in this passage right in here, and look at verse 8 again, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom. People of the world don't understand the things I'm talking about. If they had known it, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus Christ. They wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had understood that God created this heaven and earth and that God maintains this heaven and earth, we don't have to worry about the maintaining of the earth. What we have to worry about is winning people to Christ before God comes again and ends the time that we have here on the earth. We have an agenda. But it's not the wisdom of this world that we're participating in. It is the wisdom of knowing that God preplanned the world and that it is coming to an end at a certain time. Well, what interests you? Is it the things of this world? Is it who's in politics? Is it who's going to get this job? Or is it who's, who's going to take and make the most money? Is it, what are the things that really tie up your time? Or is it the fact that you've got friends that if they, die, if the Lord came today or tomorrow or the next day, they'd go to hell? You see, if you're not worried about those things, who is? If you're not worried about those things, who is? Who in your family is trying to lead your lost family to know Jesus and to come and worship Him? Who cares about that besides you? And if you're not doing those things, if you're worried about the things of the world like they are, nobody caring about their destiny. What interest us? That's the first thing that separates us between the saved and the unsaved. And then the second thing that, that separates us is what we believe. <laughs> That's an important thing. What do you believe? Now, here's the focus of what I believe. I believe that every single thing that happens in my life, every single thing, whether I break my finger, whether I take and have a cold, every single thing in my life all goes back to the fact that Jesus cared enough for me that He died for me. And Jesus settled it on the cross for me. No matter what I have to go through, no matter how bad it gets, I say, Jesus, I can handle this because you handle that. That's what we believe. We believe that everything that happens in our life is based upon what we believe. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? What else could He do for you? I know we pray that He does everything from add money in our pocket to healing us of, taking, of diseases, but I'm asking you the question is what in the world is the thing that we should be focusing on in this world? And that is that Jesus, no matter what's going on in my life, you settled it there at the cross. You settled it. That's why we show a cross in the front of our church all during the service and, and highlight it with flashing lights and different things to cause you to remember that the focus of this church is what Jesus did when He hung on that cross for you and me. What do we believe? Look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 9, I'm sorry. But as it is written, what the eye did not see and the ear did not hear, 
And what never entered into the human mind, I want you to know that nobody figured it out before it happened. Now that's the funniest thing, because as we look in the Old Testament, we can literally read that God told them it was fixing to happen, and what was going to happen, even the very city that Jesus would be born in, all of this was told to them, but nobody, nobody, no I did see, no I did hear, no ear did hear, and never did it ever enter into the mind what God prepared for those who love Him. Now God revealed these things to us by the Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going back to heaven. He died, He was buried, He was resurrected. For 40 days, he was here on earth. He was teaching the people, showing them, I'm alive. See, there's the holes. There, Put your hand in the hole in my side if you can't believe it. Just touch it and see it. It's real. And eyewitnesses all over and people that are not in the Bible is recorded outside the Bible. All of these things so much are recorded that the case for Christ, a movie that's going to be coming out next month, you ought to go see it. It's so. It's the most documented fact in history that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he was alive again for 40 days after he was dead. And he was dead for three days. Now, if that doesn't take you to convince people, and look at the medical proof that his resurrection was impossible because his death was so certain. And Satan certainly wants to energize the spirit of the world today. Satan wants to get you and me thinking about the things of this world. I, I don't know if you figured this. Maybe you, I, I don't know, you're smarter than I am, but listen to me. Do you know what you spend time thinking about in this world? It's a waste of time because there's a lot of people smarter than you and me that are doing much more thinking about it than you and I ever could. I mean, it, it's a consuming fact for so many people. I mean, they'll fist fight you over their belief. You ever notice that? I mean, you can't, you can't rationalize with a person that has the carnal mind that their mind is involved in the things of this world. But what are Christians doing to change the conversation? And to point people back to Jesus. What we believe is so different than what the world believes. So different. Look with me over at Ephesians 2, verse 1 for just a moment. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. This is when you found out about Jesus. In which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over you in the lower heavens. That's, that's here. That's earth. And the spirits now working in the disobedient. He could be working in me or you if we're disobedient to the Word of God and not in it. And we, too, all previously lived among those in our fleshly desire. My dear friend, I want you to know if you're not living today for the world and you're not consumed with the fleshly desires of this world, you have been there. You have been so consumed with the world and the fleshly desires that your focus was not upon the Lord. And you know, I talked earlier about the fact that our church is growing. We're seeing new people. And an evidence of the fact that there's a maturing going on in the congregation are people are giving more money. <laughs> you know how easy it would be for me to get you to give more money? Eh, not possible. <laughs> Nobody can get, make you give more money. You know what happens when people give more money to the church? It's because they believe in what the Lord's doing in their life and through their church. That's the reason they put money in the church, because they see something going on, and they want to be more part of it. And they say, God, here's some more dollars, let's do bigger things. I'm anxious to do that. I don't know if you notice or not, we got a bunch of chairs back there. Look back there. You see those chairs? And the instructions to the ushers are when the people come in and these are filled up, to put the chairs down. I want to see every one of them go down every church service. We've got 200 chairs in this room that we could put down. And when we get those full, in fact, before we get those full, we'll go to two services on Sunday. Two services on Sunday. I, I, I brag about this church and what y'all are doing so much to people that I know in the Lord outside. Because I talk about the Lord and the, the work that you're doing here, even when I'm with other people outside in other churches. And you know what? One of them said the other day, he says, Pastor, you're just doing such a wonderful job over there. And I, 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 I just look at him and think, well, God's at work. It says, it's amazing. You've got two. What have you got? Three services going now? 
You fill in those 200 seats three times a day now? I said, no, we're only doing it once. Because I'm always talking about how great you are in the Lord and what you're doing in the Lord and bringing your friends and people being baptized. Now, I'm not lying. I just dwell on the last one a lot, okay? <laughs> because I want to see another one. I want to see somebody else give their life to the Lord or profess that they have done that in the past. I'm anxious to see people that are proud of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, charging forward for the Lord, bringing people to know Jesus. What we believe shows up in what we do, how we act. You know, the great sinners of learning today don't want to talk about the Bible. They don't accept the deity of Jesus Christ. They don't see a need for salvation. I'm reminded of that small Oklahoma town church. Your wife came from Oklahoma, so I'm not talking about her church, of course. And uh, that small Oklahoma town church it had two churches in the city, just two. If you've ever been to Oklahoma out there, you, you understand what I'm talking about. Two churches is a big, big city. And uh, they had two churches, but they only had one distillery. And this was in the days when, when uh, you didn't buy your liquor from from all the TV advertisements. You bought your liquor from, from a distillery. So, no, where somebody was illegally doing it and, and they were making moonshine out there and all this kind of stuff. And, and the two churches would meet every Sunday and they'd get off the subject and the only thing they could focus on was the world. They'd get to talking about the distillery and talking about how that was polluting the people's minds and probably half of them sitting in that congregation had pollution in their heads themselves from where they'd been drinking out of that distillery. And they, they're talking all the time about God ought to do something about that distillery and, you know, all of this. And one time they, they decided they'd had enough and, and somebody said, listen, if we're that concerned about our city and the distillery, we ought to have a prayer meeting down here to ask God to do something about it. So they met on one Saturday night. They all met in two churches. Both of them coordinated their services, and they met in the different churches. They got down on their knees, and they began to pray, God, do something about this distillery. And as they were praying, thunder came, and lightning came, and it was a vicious thing going on. And people in the church were thinking, wow, what's God doing? It's, it's amazing. And after the service, they got out, and as they went out, they could see the fire burning down where the distillery was. And the distillery had been burnt to the ground and everything around it. It was a complete demolishing of the distillery. So the next morning in church, they all came together and they were just praising the Lord and said, God, you're so good. That is until Monday. Monday morning, they were served lawsuit papers. You see, the distillery owner found out from the insurance company that they didn't pay. They weren't going to pay for that distillery burning down. He had insurance. But acts of God are not covered by your insurance. And so early Monday morning, he had gone down to the courts and his lawyer had filed papers to sue the church for getting together with God and burning down his distillery. And it finally came to court and the judge saw him coming in and he, he got in there and they, they came up and he says, listen, before, before we get started in this, he said, I understand that the church is alleging that they have nothing to do with this, that God did not burn down that distillery. And he said, I understand now the distillery man saying that he is suing and for a big amount of money because they coordinated with God to burn down his distillery. And he said, here's what's puzzling me. He said, I have never heard this from churches before and never heard this from lost people before. He said that the atheists are now claiming that there is a God and that He acts when His people ask Him to. And the church is saying, listen, prayers don't mean anything. God didn't do that. It was just a, it was just a lightning storm that did it. We had nothing to do with it. And I want you to understand something, my dear friend. Sometimes Christians don't know how to take and allow the works of God to be interpreted to the community. If anything, the church should have gone in that morning and said, we definitely had something to do with it. We prayed God would take care of a, a blight in our city, and we God acted. And look, even the distillery man believes in God now as a result of it. Sometimes we want to protect the the lost people. What do we believe? First, what interests us? 
Second, what do we believe? It'll show up when somebody gives you a challenge. And then third, with whom do you associate? Look at chapter 2, verse 14 as I close tonight. I realize y'all are all thinking about the food, so I've got to finish. With whom, whether you're going to have two hot dogs or one, uh, with whom do you associate? Look at uh, the, the third thing. Not only there's a difference between the saved and the unsaved in that what interests us, and second, what we believe, but third, with whom we'll associate. That's something else. I want you to understand something, my dear friend. If you're a Christian and you believe in the Lord, when we come in here to praise the Lord, I don't know if your hands will be in the air. I don't know if your faces will be lit up. I don't know whether your heart is just pounding like that, saying, wow, man, God's at work and I can see it. I can see it in my life. I can see it in my church. I can see it in the workplace where I work during the week. I can see it in my family. God's at work. Praise God. With whom do you associate? Well, verse 14 tells us we can associate with the natural man. But the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's Spirit because the natural man says it's foolishness to him. He's not able to understand that the things that are happening of God are because God's doing it. He's kind of like that church that came into court and said, listen, we didn't have anything to do with it. We just prayed. You can't blame us. It wasn't our prayers that God intervened and burnt down that distillery. That's a that's called a carnal mind. By the way, you read the next chapter, you'll understand a carnal mind. A carnal mind is a is a Christian that acts like a lost person. You got lost people, you got saved people, and then you got carnal people that that are saved, but they live their life like a lost person. They dwell in the things of the world. So. The first thing he talks to them about is that in the church there in Corinth, Corinth, they had a lot of people that were carnal people or lost, one or the other. They were natural. That's what their beliefs were in. Third, second, he not only did that, but look at verse 15. He also dealt with the spiritual people. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything. The spiritual person looks at this and says, we prayed last night. That distillery burnt down. Praise God. God's at work. What can we take on next? What else in this city needs to be corrected? What else in this country needs to be corrected? We're going to get together and pray more often. And praise God that the world, that we're being sued for praying, and that God's intervening on our behalf. Praise God. What can we pray for next that God will intervene and change in this world? The spiritual man, however, can evaluate everything, yet he himself Cannot be evaluated by anyone. The people in the world look at him and say, why, why, what are you talking about? God did this. Here, look, here's the ABCs. Now, by the way, they didn't understand the ABCs before it happened. But now that it happened, they look back and they try to figure it out how they did it. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, yet, by, yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For he, or who has known the Lord's mind, and he may instruct him But we have the mind of Christ. Verse 16. For who has known the Lord's mind? You have if you've given your life to the Lord. That He may instruct you. But we have the mind of Christ. Differences between saved and unsaved? Yes. Are you saved? Then you know the differences. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for saving us. But Lord, more than just saving us, thank You for using us. Thank You for leaving us here and not taking us on to heaven. Giving us a chance, Heavenly Father, to be used of You to bring other people to know Jesus Christ. May we be busy praying for the distillery to close. (laughs) Praying that, that Sally or or Belinda will give their life to Jesus, inviting them to church even when they say, don't ask me again, believing that, Lord, you're at work in their life and their heart and their mind, and that if we just have hope, they will come, trust Jesus, because of what they see in us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Paul going to the Corinthian church and helping them to realize there's a difference between lost people and saved people. And our focus ought to be on the saved people winning the lost people to Jesus. Help us, Lord, to realize today 
that because we have a church, a place where we gather as believers, we have an opportunity to influence the communities in which we live and the communities in which we work and give their life to Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.